your character is brilliant. Just this relationship, son, father, between him and his two sons. How is it possible that for 20 years his sons didn't know what was going on until the very end? Well, I mean, like many, I mean, you know, this word sociopath is used in the movie and, uh, you know, in a kind of open ended way. And whether you want to describe it in that way or not, um, there are people who live double lives uh, and, you know, who are murderers, who are adulterers, who are, you know, uh, fraudsters of every kind. And um, the, the reason that they're successful at it is that they are able to compartmentalize their lives in, in uh, a, a, com a consummate way. Um, you know, everybody keeps asking me, were they guilty, were they innocent? Uh, you know, a lot of people thought the kids were guilty, that Ruth was guilty, that she was in on it, that they were all in on it. And, um, uh, you know, I, I'm not in the business of giving an answer to that, but, but from all the research I've done and from the more that I've understood the relationship between Mark and his father, which was really what my job was uh, taking on this role, I feel that uh, I find it hard to believe that they that they were um, taking part in it. He had two floors of his business. One was a legitimate trading floor. The other one was this money management uh, business that he was running. That was completely you know run by all these sleaze bags like Frank De Pascali and and uh, you know these other these. And, and this this was a guy that he he sort of groomed from his teenage years and had great loyalty to Bernie because of that. And probably long before the big Ponzi scheme had been helping him sort of perpetrate minor, minor, minor frauds. Um, he wouldn't let the children into that, that office at all. They didn't have the key. He never told them anything about it. They, and the result was that Mark in particular felt, uh, you know, grew up feeling inadequate, that he didn't have the keys to the castle, that he, he had never Excuse inherited me. the throne, that he, bless you, that he um, was um, not, you know, somehow not man enough to to uh, run the, the kind of operation that his father did. And that kind of insecurity ultimately was, the, you know, I, I think psychologically the, the, you know, the seat of his, of his uh, suicide. But, um, but do, do you think that was calculating on Bernie's part? Because there's a brutal scene between you and Robert De Niro, where Robert basically shames you and says, you're not as good, in so many words, you're not as good and not as smart as your brother. Do you think it was a calculating thing, basically back off, don't ask too many questions, well, keep you in your place and stuff, let me take care of stuff? There was a, I mean, a, I think... You know what's interesting and upsetting, but fascinating about the relationship is that it was full of love as well. Right. I mean, their family was very loving, mm -hmm. and they, uh, you know, they had a lot of uh, physical affection together. You see photographs of them as as young people, and they, you know, their arms were around each other, and they were like, you know, by all accounts, very very loyal to each other. Uh, I think it was a, a, a difficult thing for the spouses and girlfriends of the boys as they were growing up because there was just, you know, an expectation of like you're in or you're out, um, that, uh, you know, family comes first, that the, you know, relationships with, this, with the spouses were less important than the relationships within the family. Um, and, and I do believe that Bernie and, and Ruth were were very, you know, adoring of their children and at the same time uh, abusive of them and that kind of playing off of the two brothers, playing the two brothers off each other and, and making Mark feel that he didn't have the, the same qualities that his brother, leadership qualities that his brother might have, you know, is a, it's a form of abuse. And of, and of course, on, on the one hand, it was to protect him because he didn't, you know, he, in his mind, he, you know, somehow if this whole thing blew up, the, the kids, everybody else was going to be all right. Um, because the, he, he didn't believe that there was any way of connecting them to the thing because, because he, he kept it so separate. Um, and on the other hand, you know, I think there was just something, you know, he was a, an incredibly controlling and, and dominating 
uh, presence as a kind of pater familias in, uh, you know, in, in the... Did they know that there was a 17th floor of the kids, or they did not know? Yeah, yeah, they knew that he so had they a whole knew other business. And, and they kept they, asking him, you know, what happens when you die? Like, if, mm-hmm. who's going to take it over? Why mm-hmm. don't you tell us how to run the damn mm-hmm. business? Like, I... You know, if you're going to die, you know, I'm not saying like, I don't want you to die, but like if you, what, God forbid you got in a plane mm. crash or a, a car accident or something, who's going to take over, you know, and, and he's, you know, and he was always vague about it and he just never would explain to them, you know, mm. what exactly the business was that he was running downstairs. And so uh, it was increasingly frustrating to them and, and undermining to their, to their confidence. But Mark's in particular, uh, Andrew was a much more... Um, even keel personality and and uh, was much more able to you know his uh, girlfriend ended up kind of pulling him further and further away from the family and he actually left the business altogether and started a fishing rod and reel business which like I think saved him really up until cancer struck him down but Mark was you know still determined to kind of follow in his father's footsteps